And hi. Welcome to our first gender talk of the semester. My, My name is Dr. M. Shadi Malaklu, and I'm the director of the Bell Hooks Center at Berea College and chair of its Women's and Gender and Soon to Be Sexuality Studies Department. I want to begin today by recognizing that our center and college are located on the ancestral homelands of the Eastern Band Cherokee Indians, the Cherokee Nation, the Shawnee Tribe, and the Uchi. We recognize that their material and spiritual relationships with these lands and waterways precede ours, and that their sovereignty has persisted amidst continued removal. There is no land statement that can sufficiently account for this violence, and so I will not attempt one. What I will say is that we need to do better, and that the Bell Hook Center invites you to disrupt settler systems of domination with us. The work of decolonization is a communal one. I'm excited to be in conversation today with Thales founder and artistic director Katie Pyle about how their work radically reimagines the ballet canon to include the legacies and futures of non-binary, trans, and gender non-conforming queer dancers. Since 2011, Ballet has been challenging ballet's cis-heteropatriarchal, racist, and body-shaming legacy. Through the creation of full-length story ballets, public classes, and international conversations that defy and reinvent what ballet can be and who it can represent. This conversation will dive into that history, its challenges and triumphs, and look forward to a radical queer future. Katie identifies as a genderqueer lesbian dancer and choreographer. They founded Ballets in 2011 to push back against ballet's strict gender norms. Ballets incorporates the history and lineage of lesbian, queer, and transgender people in the ballet canon, and does so in ways that are accessible, for example, through open classes and public engagement. The company's major works include The Firebird, a Ballets, a dance space project in 2013, Variations on Virtuosity, a gala with the stars of the Ballets at American Realness at Avron's Art Center in 2015, Sleeping Beauty and the Beast at La Mama in 2016, Slavic Goddesses at The Kitchen in 2017, and most recently, Giselle of Loneliness at The Joyce in 2021. Katie has queered the ballet canon at Princeton, Yale, New York University, Sarah Lawrence College, Bodoin College, Beloit College, and now Berea College, to name just a handful of their dance residencies. They currently teach undergraduate dance classes at Eugene Lane College at the New School and at Marymount Manhattan College, and train professional dancers at Gibney Dance 890 Broadway. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the hard work of my colleagues namely our program associates, including women's gender and sexuality studies students, Malaya Wright and Autumn Young, and my administrative colleague, Kat Moses, without whom none of what we do would be possible. <laughs> Additionally, I want to thank the dance program's generous co-sponsorship of this event. We are grateful to be in conversation and collaboration with dance faculty and students. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Katie Pyle. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so thrilled to get to share a little bit of my work and what I do with you and, and share in a continued process of experimentation, um, which is influenced and informed by you and what these conversations that we're having today in the classes that I've been able to visit and in our dancing together um, in various classes. And I welcome also your, your comments today, but also online. You can reach out to me through my website or through Instagram or any of the platforms that you find out there on social media where we overlap. Um, and yeah, it's, it's important to me that this process continues to grow and that I get to learn from you. So thank you in advance for your participation. Um, yeah. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. I wanted to start with, because Ballas push, pushes back against this, what would you describe are the traditional gender norms of ballet culture and how does Ballas confront and challenge those norms? Right. So I think, you know, the typical ballerina, right, is kind of the, the thing that we first think of when we think of ballet. And maybe you think of uh, 
a very thin white woman, young, wearing point shoes that are pink, pink tights, um, a black leotard or a tutu or something like that, um, which already is sort of problematic <laughs> image, right? With pink tights being uh, a racist expression of what is supposed to be beautiful, this very like confining image is already there, just like from looking at it from the outside. Um, point shoes, I feel like mixed about. We were, I was talking with uh, one of your professors earlier about point shoes and like, they can be horrible, they can be painful, they can also be kind of fun and allow your body to do different things. So I'm like mixed about that. Um, but I think inside of ballet, there's all of these tensions that I'm curious about exploring. So, but I'll leave that for later. Um, so with the ballerina, you I have to stand up <laughs> because you think of this person who's like very uh, innocent and kind of docile and like gentle and presenting like this very like feminine affect. It's in the tilt of the head and the way that you move your eyes and the way that you defer constantly to the other people on stage. Um, there's often always like a corps de ballet also, which is made of many female dancers who are all dressed exactly the same. They have those pink tights on, they have like a white tutu or a white skirt, and they all have to have the same body and the same skin, and they have to like all stand and just be in <laughs> deference. And that's sort of the ideal beauty of the ballet dancer. Um, male dancers in ballet have a more complex history in a way because from the mid 18th century through the 19th century in Paris and in London, all the male roles were played by female dancers. So there's actually this like kind of gender queerness that is part of the lineage, which has been covered up, right? We don't necessarily know that history, even like people like me who studied ballet growing up, I didn't know that, that that was what was happening. But generally you represent as a male dancer like this, you hold your neck in a different way, you look at things and you walk directly towards them. You don't like <laughs> go backwards away from them. You, you move forward, you um, lift other people, you do big jumps, you do these big kind of dramatic turns, whereas so that's representing, right, a lot of those ideals of masculinity that we have in this culture of like strength and power and like agency. Yeah, yeah that's some you. of it. I have to had to stand up to do that because it's like too hard to talk about. I appreciate the way that Valles queers this. And I'm wondering, is there a relationship between drag culture and the kind of work that Valles is doing? For me personally, that's there's a big link because I grew up doing ballet, learning female roles, learning how to be <laughs> docile and gentle and feminine and delicate. Um, and I came out when I was 18, when I went to college and had left ballet behind because I had been in conflict with the expectations and with my body, which didn't like fit in because I'm strong, I'm like muscular. I like to jump, I like to turn, I like to take up a lot of space. And before I get to drag, I just have to say that my teachers in that conservatory ballet program said to me, you look like a Mack truck when you're dancing, which now I'm like, that's amazing. Like that's very powerful, you know, a truck. But it was obviously like a big diss from uh, the faculty and I was told you would have had a great career if you'd been born a boy. So I was very ashamed of my masculinity or the characteristics in me that were seen as being masculine, right, in that world. And when I came out, I went to college, I like abandoned ballet and I started a drag king group with four of my friends that were in the dance department at Holland's. And it was the first time that I went on stage and felt power. 
in my body and I felt sexy and I felt celebrated for the powerful things that I could do and like the dynamic movements that I could make. Um, so that was just a really revelatory situation to be able to like put on this different outfit, play, get into this different character and kind of like allow myself to imagine a different possibility for my body. And that just really hadn't been something that I had access to before. Um, but I've also always loved dress up. Like that's been something throughout my life that I like to play in that space. So drag culture um, in Roanoke, Virginia, where I went to school, also exposed me to all of these drag queens who were playing with femininity in ways that were much more extravagant and much more exciting than I had seen. And they, there were representations of femininity that weren't always like meek and docile. They were powerful and beautiful in these like big, wild, colorful ways. Um, and drag culture continues to be like a big source of inspiration to me. Um, I think when I see performers like stepping into different parts of their power, that is, is just really inspiring to me. So I love watching all that we were talking before. Like I love watching all the drag race, <laughs> the various you know, iterations and going to shows and seeing how drag culture plays with gender as not a given that has to be assigned to you based on the sex you were assigned at birth, but can be like a playground for anyone, hopefully. And it's getting better. Like there's, you know, we, there's still work inside of that world to expand, to actually be inclusive, but yeah. I appreciate your attention to embodiment. And I also want to return to something you gestured towards in your first response, mm -hmm. which is how do we co-think the cis heteropatriarchy of dance with its whiteness? Mm -hmm. There's just so much limit that is inside of like the current representation of ballet because of its insistence on whiteness and its insistence on um, a set of values and aesthetics that are really boring um, and not enlivening. So I think artists have a responsibility to imagine new worlds. And as dancers, we get to do that through embodiment and through play and through like kind of a shared ritual of performance where we try things on and present things to you, which I'm gonna show you a little bit of videos. Um, and audiences get to share in that process of like reimagining what beauty can be and like what actually we would wanna value uh, instead of what we've just been given and we've been told that this is what's beautiful and this is what's good. And I think it's an exciting moment because the world is changing and thinking differently and and it's possible to have these kind of interventions so yeah I'm excited to be part of that well thank yeah. you you want to tell us a little bit about what we're going to yeah. watch so this um this clip is from Giselle of Loneliness which was my most recent show at the Joyce Theater in June 2021 it was filmed in the empty theater because the theater was still closed this summer in New York, um, and it was broadcast to people in their homes. And it's like a reality TV show, kind of a setup, but it's based on the story of Giselle. <laughs> okay, so that's a lot. I'm gonna try to break it down. Giselle is a story ballet from the romantic era in ballet. So it's kind of the iconic, like, long white tutus, this real celebration of a white femininity that is about all those things that I named, like the delicacy, the frailty. The main character is Giselle and she's like a peasant girl who's like the most beautiful, delicate peasant in the village. And this nobleman 
named Albrecht comes, disguises himself as like a commoner and seduces her, basically. She falls in love with him and it then turns out that he's like actually betrothed to this noble woman and he was just messing with her. And so she uh, goes crazy and this kind of dramatic scene called the mad scene and ends up killing herself with his sword. So there's a lot of drama <laughs> inside of it. Um, and I took that, that story and turned it into this like reality audition show where all these different dancers who would never be able to be cast in the role of Giselle in a traditional ballet company are auditioning for the role. So these are, these are dancers that have a lot of ballet training and history, but who have not been allowed to be um, themselves inside of the form. So I, I took the idea of the mad scene uh, into a personal kind of narrative of like what parts of ourselves do we try to hide or give up in order to fit in? And how are those parts now coming loose inside of like embodiment and realization of who we actually are? And the audience uh, judges, right? So the, the setup is that you would each have like on your cell phone, a set of criteria where you rate the dancers based on their jumps, their turns, their feet, their extensions, their body type, their virginality, their ethereality, their frailty, their ability to present suffering. So these are all kind of the value systems of mainstream ballet. Um, yeah, and then we have judges, which are these older white women, which is also kind of <laughs> representative of, of the way that uh, this stuff goes down in mainstream ballet. Um, the dancer you're gonna see doing the solo is Maxfield Haynes, um, who is, well, you'll see, they're amazing. Um, and then we're gonna watch one other clip of another dancer named MJ Markowitz. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you Kat. A little, Thank you. yeah, it's a little depressing. No, it's, um, it's actually <laughs> so, lovely. We're going to open yeah. up to questions in a moment. I wanted to think about intersectionality for a second. Mm -hmm. So the Bell Hooks Center is very invested in thinking about uh, race and conversation with gender and sexuality. And I wonder if you can speak to thinking about this, these last two things, specifically the relationship uh, between redefining femininity, both for gender nonconforming persons, but also for persons of color. The first dancer um, was a black dancer, right? And so black people don't often get afforded the trappings of femininity, right? And so I'm wondering how y'all are redefining femininity and redefining gender in ways that make space for those conversations. Yeah. I mean, I think um, this white feminine ideal is, you know, I'm trying to say in this show that that's like really oppressive <laughs> to everyone that is having to intersect with it that doesn't, I don't know. I, I really don't know who it's benefiting. But um, these dancers, Maxfield, I find has such a beautiful, the first performer, has such a beautiful, luscious, feminine quality that wouldn't be allowed within that narrow definition that has existed and their blackness also is prevented has prevented them from being able to be seen in this like classical ballet world and to be appreciated for the beauty that they have and the the power that they have and like the new definitions of femininity that we could have which I think are just like so much better <laughs> like when I look at that I'm just like this is so much better than like for me like any other version of Giselle I've seen so um, I'm really trying to show with this work like this ideal is not working it's not um, giving us pleasure it's not giving us a sense of 
connection to other people through performance or through like the actual uh, audience response, right? So for the dancers and the audiences, it's just like failing. Um, and then for MJ, MJ feels very uncomfortable having to like fit within <laughs> femininity and learned how to do it and was trained how to do it. I was trained how to do it um, in this like white femininity that's like so delicate and frail um, and just is so much and you can see it a little bit more in the beginning part of their solo they're just so restricted and they're like shaking and just like trapped and that's not something that I had to choreograph that's MJ's experience of like doing that material so just like making that visible like this is causing suffering and this is causing people to be less than what they could be and like that's not beauty <laughs> to me like that's not love that's not like um our humanity, our full humanity. So yeah, just like trying to address that real, very real, very present, very visible ideal with the reality of like what our experiences are um, and to start to hopefully shift the aesthetic for future dancers and just say like, no, we don't have to do this. Like we can collectively shift our ideas of like what we appreciate in each other. I mean, that's another thing about um, ballet class and like the training is that you're silent. You don't, you don't cheer for anyone. You don't clap for anyone. You don't snap for anyone. You don't like vocalize any support. And so there's also this way that that oppressive mentality just like gets conveyed and everyone is afraid. <laughs> like everyone in that room is afraid because they're trying to just like be the thing that the teacher wants or whatever the studio wants. And you don't know that what you are and the truth of who you are is actually really gorgeous <laughs> and like really exciting. So, um, that's, you know, I'm just thinking about like the ballet class we had yesterday and the classes I try to like m move towards um, more vocalization and like celebration of each other, which comes from drag culture and it comes from Africanist aesthetic dance practices where there's more connection to each other and like acknowledgement. And so I feel like that, um, I hope, <laughs> is like helping to shift because I think it's not just the dancers themselves, it's like how we see each other that has to change um, and like what ideals we're subscribing to and kind of looking at the internalization of those aesthetics like in ourselves as dancers and in how we see each other and as audiences is like all part of doing that work yeah you talked about pleasure and you talked about joy in the class yes. yesterday yeah and bell talks about love right so how does dance in the way that ballas imagines it become a vehicle for joy and pleasure and self-love and redefinition yeah it's just all of it just has to be that <laughs> like it's just um i think play has been a site of freedom for me and in connecting with these dancers and connecting to, because it's so complicated. Like it's hard to go back to ballet because there's so many things about it that feel bad. <laughs> so it's like, why? <laughs> like why even do it? But I think one of the original motivations for me was that like I wanted to jump, I wanted to turn. And that for me is very pleasurable to like do those kind of movements and to do them with other people and in these costumes and with these like beautiful sets and lights and like fantasies. Um, so taking that stuff back, which doesn't belong to ballet, it belongs to like every person that wants to access it and like creating that space where we can, again, like 
celebrate each other, but also just like feel pleasure in our bodies, feel joy, feel... To live yeah. in our bodies. So yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And to like take that away, because it's like something that was taken away from us and to, to reclaim that and be like, I'm not just doing this so that you like it. I'm doing it so I like it. <laughs> and then you get to witness me enjoying myself. And that's like a very different kind of perspective than like the classical model, yeah. So thinking about embodiment, joy and pleasure, let's talk about sex. Mm -hmm. um, how does the erotic play into this? Yeah, so I think ballet, when I was growing up, um, I think my family, my family let me do ballet because they thought it was like a virginal <laughs> space and it was like a space where it wasn't sexy. Like they were like, we don't want you doing sexy dances or wearing sexy outfits or whatever. Um, but as I've researched ballet, ballet has always been an erotic space and has been a space that was created, the movement was created by sex workers, um, whether consensually or unconsensually in, put into those systems. Um, they were courtiers in like the European system and then there's a whole lot of stuff in there. But <laughs> essentially, there's this codification of like gender presentation for femininity and masculinity that could be seen through this lens of like, oh, we learned how to like present these things that are sexy and desirable and beautiful. And like, I'm going to show you my inner ankle because like that's a sexy, forbidden, erogenous zone. Um, so I love like reclaiming that because I think it's really... Uh, flies against like what my parents <laughs> thought and that's always fun um, but it also just feels like a reclamation for the people that actually made those movements and like brought their artistry and their intelligence and their embodiment and their um, sensuality into the parts of ballet that I actually like because I like playing with those things I like playing with the seduction and the like various kinds of presentation in order to um, elicit different responses from an audience. And we were talking earlier about, you know, ballet is very sexual. Like you have a male dancer like standing like this, <laughs> holding a woman in a tutu like this, right? Like literally her crotch is just like in his crotch and he's like going like this and she's like da, da, da. and it's like very stylized um that's good no it's good <laughs> it's very stylized but it's like clearly an intimation of heterosexual sex um so i just find it like continually i'm just like how how is it that we can like allow this kind of sexuality and see it as like this high art and yet uh, jazz dance or hip hop or other African diasporic dance forms are seen as like too sexy and too erotic or whatever. And it's like, that doesn't, <laughs> that's not real. And the parts of ballet that I like that I wanna reclaim are actually playing with that um, embodiment and, and erotics and and especially there's in other shows. We, this show doesn't have any partnering because COVID, but in Sleeping Beauty and the Beast, there's uh, like six duets in the second act that are based on like BDSM uh, 1993 queer culture. And you can watch some of them. <laughs> online on my Vimeo page if you want to check that out. Um, but it's, it's also fun for me to think about partnering through that lens because there's like a clear articulation of power, there's a collaboration, there's consent between the dancers. It's not the man <laughs> just moving the ballerina around and like showing her off. The duets that I make and the partnering that I make is about uh, 
both of the dancers working together to make something happen. Even if a dancer is in a submissive role, there's like an awareness of like, oh, like I'm just like feigning this submission so to allow you to do this thing or to facilitate you doing this thing. So there's like a very different, does that make sense? There's like, agency. yeah, there's agency and there's an agreed upon power structure, which I think is like totally missing in classical ballet. And even though the dancers throughout its history have like, made their art, made space for themselves, like made their impact. Like at the end of the day, those contributions all get assigned to a single white man, you know, who's in charge of the situation, but is actually just like taking <laughs> from the people that are making it happen. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Katie. I want to totally. Yeah. You know, arguments that you make to defend it or that they mm. make to um, get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. I'm going to just mention critics <laughs> because I think that maybe speaks to it a little bit. And then you can also help me clarify if I don't get to what you're asking. Um, so, critical response from people that are very attached to classical ballet has been mixed, but it has been, there's been some real backlash and, and kind of angry <laughs> write-ups and, and just like diminishing of what we're doing, um, which is difficult. And we have to, you know, go back to like, kind of doing it for ourselves and each other and like remembering that the community, cause usually, you know, at these shows, I mean, this one was a live stream, but like ballet shows bring out so many cool people <laughs> like that come, they come on dates, they dress up, they like, you know, this, this whole um, situation to kind of come out and celebrate. So, when the critics come in that are kind of coming from the more mainstream ballet world, they don't understand necessarily what they're seeing and it's um, seen as a failure. And, and I embrace that, even though it hurts my feelings to like hear that, I also am like, yes, good, like we're failing. <laughs> and failure to me is like a real space of possibility because I feel like things have to fall apart before you can like start to shift it and see things differently. Um, and in terms of like the classes and the training that I do, I am now working, the classes that I teach in New York are for professional dancers who have a lot of ballet history because I'm really curious about unlocking the parts of themselves that they denied or that they um, gave up in order to belong inside of ballet. And so that's going really well. <laughs> like it's really fun and we have a lot of fun together and bringing this culture of allowing and celebrating is like, I think shifting people's dancing too. And I think at the end of the day, when you see that, like I think, you know, these dancers are a great example. Like when you can see it, it's like, why not? That just seems better. Um, but I think there are, like I've applied to this place called the Center for Ballet and the Arts in New York for seven years. And they claim to be like a progressive 
ballet institution and I, they never accept my <laughs> proposals to do any work there because um, they see it as like being unprofessional um, or not maintaining a high enough aesthetic standard. Um, and I don't maintain their aesthetic standards. Like I can't argue with that, but I have my own and I just kind of go back to like trying to think every day about like what I actually value, what I actually want to see, what I actually think is beautiful, what I actually feel connected to. And um, I'm not interested in like getting in there on their terms and I can do my work in other places. I can do my work on a basketball court. Like I can do, you know, I can do it on Zoom. I can do it in um, whatever space that I can get access to. So that was a rambling answer. And <laughs> thanks for your question. Yeah, yeah Dr. Fari. Mm. Now I'm like going to be subscribing to all the platforms. I'm really excited. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, there's no mic. Um, you talked a little bit about what sounded like to me your incorporation of call and response when you said, like, ask, what, what was it, African diaspora? Yeah. Yes. And so then just now you're talking about how your aesthetics don't really match the high art expectations of traditional ballet. And so I was wondering. I think it's so much brought in by the dancers that I work with also. So just, I, I am in a very collaborative process with whoever's in my shows. We are like working together to think about um, their character and their aesthetics and their costume and kind of like build this fantasy world together. So um, like Maxfield performs with a drag ballet company that's called Trocadero, the ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo, which is really cool in a lot of ways. And it's also, I just have to say, <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, it makes fun of, it's like the whole thing is like, we're like men in drag. And so that's difficult for Maxfield, who is a non-binary person, but it's a space where they can work and they can like tour the world and do this stuff. But it's like, it's always couched in the thing of like, this is drag, you're not really a woman, right? And like, that's not great at all. That's not good. But there are aspects of that culture and of that drag culture that are really fun and like come into what Maxfield does. Um, and I think drag culture also overlapping with ball culture is definitely comes in to the work with dancers that I work with. Um, MJ has like a lot of hip hop training and also was at the Ailey School for many years. So there's Horton technique, there's Dunham technique, um, and there's just all of these different forms that the dancers bring. Um, yeah, I'm just like really inspired by <laughs> the people that I work with and what what they bring to the table and how they move and all those forms that like literally live inside of our bodies because like everything we study just becomes a part of us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I I did ballet growing up 
And then I actually had like a career as a performer, not in ballet. So I did like postmodern experimental dance and dance theater in New York throughout my 20s. And I was able to express myself more, like my identity more inside of those forms up to a certain point. There's like a whole problem with postmodern dance, which is around like this fantasy of having a neutral body, right? And like abstraction of the body. Um, so I felt like inside of those works, like Merce Cunningham is like a really good example. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but um, person, but it's like the dancer is just a body in space and their identity doesn't matter. <laughs> so that was, that was something I was reacting against. And um, I think ultimately I was involved in these shows that were not necessarily the neutral body shows, but other shows where I got to be born myself, which were cooler kinds of dance, but they would have like a really limited audience and it would just be our friends that came or like our partners or like people that we were trying to date. And it would be, you know, like 20 people in a room. And ballet is really has a bigger reach. And every little town in this country seems to have a studio where you can take a ballet class. So for me, like confronting ballet feels more exciting because it's kind of the root of all of these evils, <laughs> right? People say ballet is the root of all dance, which is totally bullshit, but it is the root of a lot of evils in dance. So for me to be able to address that form feels like I can have a bigger impact on the dance culture because it makes very visible like what the problems are. It's like, it's much easier to kind of see it in relief and the aesthetics of ballet still infiltrate all these other dance forms because people will say, oh, you can't take a hip hop class at our studio if you're not also enrolled in ballet. Like that kind of thinking is still happening. Um, and it's really messed up. You know, I am not saying that ballet should be <laughs> the form. I would be very happy to just like destroy ballet completely through this process um, or make it into something else. But because of its like expanded reach, that's why I was sort of interested in it. And because it's like so fundamental. Yeah, it's just everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. We have time for one more, yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> there's. Um, um, yeah. Oh. So you know there's no difference. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I because you you had said racist, and I I would have not thought of that mm -hmm. way as like racist. Um, I would have thought more misogynistic. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah. I think they go together for sure. Um, I didn't, but I, I just wonder if, I mean, people who are not from the queer community, I mean, are they interested in your company? I mean, I am interested in your yeah. company because I don't really like how they define it, how, how much feminine I am or how much masculine I am, and, and, and I feel that would be attractive to so many people. Totally. Yes, I, um, I have people of all identities that like come to my classes and I think I'm, I'm thrilled to have people of all identities also come and witness the work and be a part of being in the audience. Um, my partners like parents who are in their 70s came to the Firebird and I remember my partner's dad just being like oh wow this is like such a side of possibility for me like I never thought that I could be 
you know, feminine in this way or like accept support. Like I've never seen a representation of like a male character being supported and being held. And he was very moved by that. So I'm like, I'm, I think that the message is like for humans, right? And there's so many ways that like all of these oppressions like hold us all down. And if we can like make spaces to be more expansive, like that also helps everyone. So I'm very happy to like include people of all identities. I do work with specifically queer dancers in the shows because that's the value that I have um, in terms of like my agenda of like what I wanna present and like the opportunities that I wanna give to people that are not getting opportunities in other um, companies, but like dancers are all <laughs> out of work right now. Like it's a bad time. So um, I wish I could, I don't know, give everybody all the money, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you all. Don't forget, we have a colloquium event Tuesday. Yes. Uh, with Angela Anderson about uh, feminist coaching and entrepreneurship. So we hope that you'll join us virtually for that event. Thank you so much.